was in the early evening of Thursday, December 9, 1965, that the night editor of the Greensburg, Pennsylvania Tribune Review sent me to the little rural community of Kecksburg, Pennsylvania, to cover the reported landing of an, an unidentified flying object in the woods near a farmer's field. When I arrived, state police and armed soldiers blocked access to what was the reported landing site. And I was told that if I ventured into that field, I'd be arrested. Yet they told me that nothing had happened. Hmm. Fast forward to today. We have with us on the Lean to the Left podcast, UFO investigator, Stan Gordon, a Pennsylvanian who for these past 59 years has been searching for the truth about what really happened that night. So stay with us. Welcome to Lean to the Left, home of no-holds-barred commentary, plus interviews with fascinating people, some of them top experts, others simply with interesting stories to tell. You'll never know who'll show up at Lean to the Left. Now here's your host, Bob Gaddy. Stan's been researching UFO sightings, Bigfoot encounters, and other mysterious events in Pennsylvania since 1959. So when the Kecksburg incident occurred, it was right at his wheelhouse. He's former Pennsylvania State Director of the Mutual UFO Network and produced the UFO video documentary, Kecksburg, The Untold Story. He's written four books, including his latest, Creepy Cryptids and Strange UFO Encounters of Pennsylvania. Back in 2017, Stan invited me to speak at the annual Kecksburg Volunteer Fire Department's UFO Festival to recount my experience as a reporter that night. Now it's my turn to have him on my show. Stan, welcome to the Lean to the Left podcast, my friend. Bob, it's uh, great to be on your show, and it's great to hear your voice again. Thank you, my friend. Hey, tell us what your investigation into the Kessberg UFO incident has revealed, if anything. Bob, I'll tell you, we could speak for hours or days about what I've learned about Kecksburg. It's a long story, but very fascinating. I remember that evening very well. I was 16 years old when the information was breaking on news around the greater Pittsburgh area. I happened to be listening to, you may remember, there was, on KDK Radio, there was a talk show named Contact, and the host of the show was the late Mike Levine. Yeah, I and, remember that, sure. And, and he had a special guest on that night. His name was Frank Edwards, who was a journalist who had written some books on unusual happenings. So I was tuning in to listen to him. Mm -hmm. Almost the entire show was focusing on this breaking news story of this brilliant fiery object that was seen from Ontario, Canada, over Michigan, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And about 4.47 p.m. that afternoon, the, the phones at the police stations, the newspapers, radio and TV around Pittsburgh were jammed with calls about this fire object that was moving across the sky. Mm -hmm. And it reportedly had fallen outside of the uh, village of Kecksburg down the wooded area. Mm -hmm. And it got much more interesting as was that evening. Reports were coming in that the military was arriving in the Kecksburg area to search for an unidentified flying object. And we could talk for hours and hours about what people encountered out there. And you were out there, of course, and others were there. Other reporters came in from all over the Pittsburgh area that evening, from radio, TV, and newspapers. They all became a part of the story, like you have, because they either saw or they uh, interacted with uh, authorities at the scene. Yeah. So it's an amazing story, and I've learned a lot about it. I can tell you this. Over the years, independent sources told me that the object was taken from the scene on a military flatbed tractor trailer during the early morning hours of December 10th. It mm -hmm. was taken to Lockbourne Air Force Base near Columbus, Ohio, under heavy guard. They backed the truck and the object that was covered with a tarp into a hangar. They set up a security perimeter around the hangar, and they were given the shoot-to-kill order to anybody who approached that hangar without the proper clearance. I actually talked to one of the guards who was on the security team. And, mm -hmm. and then it stayed there a short time, and it went on to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And where it's at today, we just don't know. Okay. Wow. Yeah, I, you, you mentioned that I was there. I was. And, and it was an amazing thing because I had been covering a, I think it was a school board meeting or something, and I came back to the, to the newsroom. And the editor, the night editor, put his arm around my shoulder, and he says, Hey, Bob, I've had the story of the century for you. 
<laughs> and I'm thinking, oh, yeah, here I am, what, 22 years old, and he's sending me out in some wild goose chase. So I went out there, and, it, yeah, it was amazing. There, there were armed guards, cops, state police, members of the military, lining the road, keeping people from, there were a couple of hundred at least, local people there trying to figure out what had happened, if anything. And it was an amazing thing. I couldn't get I couldn't get down to the scene. I could see some lights where they apparently were working, but they wouldn't let me go. And uh, this story has followed me my whole career. And it's an amazing thing because I've, as a journalist, I've covered, I covered Martin Luther King. I covered politics, covered the Democratic Convention in 1968. Lots of things that you would think would have made a, a bigger impact on my life. But this Kecksburg UFO thing, they've had me on TV and everything else doing this thing and looking into it. So anyway, I'm happy to have you with us and Stan. And I know you've made it almost a life's uh, mission to not only figure this out, but figure out other interesting activities that have occurred over the years too. Anyway, what do you think about the reports that this object that landed appeared to be steered, that it just didn't shoot down from the sky, that it seemed to make a left-hand turn and in order to land where it landed? Do you believe those reports? Oh, yeah, there's no doubt about it. you got to remember, there was not a lot of information in 1965. There was very few names in the paper, and very few people were talking about it. Well, over a period of weeks and months and years, I tracked down hundreds of people who were involved, from reporters, state police, many volunteer firemen, citizens that came in that night, multitudes of credible people. And, and many of those people never went public for different reasons. You've got to remember, so in 65, some of the witnesses were teenagers or young kids. A lot of them, years later, they became police officers, educators. One was involved in politics. A lot of federal people who, for various reasons, didn't want to go public, but they talked to me and gave me their statements. We tracked down many different witnesses. And back in 1970, back in 70, I found the first of three volunteer research groups investigating these cases. I had scientists and engineers and police officers and former military specialists that volunteer their time to go involved with me out in the field to investigate. So in the 80s, when things broke, see, it was in 1987 when I was holding a very large public UFO display at the West Warren Mall where thousands of people came in, that by sheer luck, a family happened to walk by. We just had a small display on Kecksburg at that time because we didn't know a lot until mm -hmm. actually around the mid-'80s or late-'80s we began to find a lot more information out. And this man and his family happened to walk by, and they were stopping. One of my associates was there with talking to a, a visitor, and they were talking about Kecksburg, and this guy said, excuse me, but are you talking about the thing that happened in Kecksburg? And they said, yeah. And he said, I was a member of the search team that found the object. That turned into a, a major important step. Yeah. And that fellow, we spent, spent many days with him, interviews over the years. He was not from Kecksburg. He was a member of a volunteer fire department from the early Trobe, mm -hmm. who was called out with other mutual aid fire departments that evening in 1965 to look okay. for a possible downed aircraft in the area as the okay. reports were coming in. Uh -huh. But it, it's a really interesting story. His story has been verified by, by other people as well. But I can tell you this, what we now know, because there were so many people involved that saw this along the path, that yeah. we could plot it. So this object came in from the greater Pittsburgh area around 4.47 p.m. It's just getting dark. It moves over the city of Greensburg. Unfortunately, I did not see it. It moved out towards Route 30 East. And then you might remember where the old GB store was out there, yeah. which is now Giant Eagle. It made a turn to the right, so it made a turn to the south. It was seen by people all along this community, such as Marguerite, Norville, Mammoth. It mm. moved out to the mountains of Laurelville. According to one witness who saw it, he ran out to the road to watch as it moved over. He said it hesitated over the mountain, began to track back towards the outskirts of Kecksburg, made another turn down and dropped down into the woods. But other locals saw that as well. But here's the interesting thing we did not know in 1965. Mm -hmm. When some of the local people saw this thing coming in very low, within a few hundred feet off the ground before it fell, moving very slowly, yeah. and they saw it fall into the woods, some mm -hmm. of those locals went down into the woods after it fell and came across that large metallic acorn-shaped object semi-buried in the ground. 
And this thing was about 10 to 12 feet in length, about 8 to 10 feet in diameter, shaped like a big, kind of an off-gold color metallic acorn, but mm-hmm. there's no weld marks, no seams, no ribbon marks on it, nothing that says USA, but on the raised-up part of the object, witnesses said to what appeared to be some odd-looking symbols raised off the surface. Okay. Now... There's a. There have been suggestions that this was some sort of military device that might even have been red, radioactive. Do you believe that? There was talk from the beginning, and it was in the Trib story, I think you may have wrote that one, that there was talk that night that no one's being allowed anywhere near the object because right. there was talk of radiation. Yep. And we have no way to know that, but I can tell you this. So I interviewed many people who lived around the area. There mm-hmm. was one family, it was the Hayes family, and they did go public and talked about this. And mm-hmm. there were quite a number of children in that family at the time. They are running a farmhouse close to where the object fell. Right. So the kids, and, and John Hayes in particular, who luckily is still alive, he and his siblings were looking out the windows all around the house and saw all the military trucks coming in, going down into the field, and they were watching all the activity. John saw a military flatbed tractor trailer in the distance go down empty and later come back up with an object with a tarp over it so it wasn't empty anymore. But then John and his brothers and sisters, they played in the woods every day. That was their back. That was their playground. They were down every day. They were down to the day before. They went back the next morning because of all the activity down the woods to see what was going on. Mm-hmm. They noticed the trees were knocked down. The trees were damaged. But John and his brother ran into a fellow was down there with some type of equipment. They thought it was either a Geiger counter or a metal detector. The Mm -hmm. man told the boys, you better get out of here. There's a chance of radiation. They didn't know what radiation meant. They went home and asked their parents. Okay. All right. There is a replica of the object, which, as you said, looks like a giant acorn on display at the Kecksburg Volunteer Fire Department. It's complete with those strange markings that, some eyewitnesses said they saw. What do you make of those markings? Here's the whole thing. There's a lot of reproductions that were done, and I would say that there, it's pretty much generic. I don't think anybody for sure, only a few were close enough to see them. Nobody okay. paid much attention to them. They were down looking for a downed aircraft. There mm-hmm. was not good lighting. It was in the dark. When they, Those who were near it, didn't want to get too close to it because they didn't know what the thing was. They were looking for an aircraft, and they realized they'd never seen anything like this thing before. Right. So they didn't want to touch it. And only from memory, like Jim Romansky, who, after seeing it for years, he went to libraries trying to look up ancient writings. And he said the closest thing he could recall was it looked something like ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. Mm. Luckily, because of his family background, he was somewhat familiar with Cyrillic. And he said what he saw was not Soviet. It was not Soviet markings like on a craft that you see. So that was interesting. But right. we just there's something we can't say for sure what the symbols actually look like. It's only from memory who, the, from those who are recalled. Okay. Now, you've exp- since then, Stan, you've expanded your research to include other UFO sightings, Bigfoot encounters, and then, of course, you wrote this latest book about creepy cryptids. First of all, what is a cryptid, Stan? What the hell is that? Okay, it's, it's a term that's getting pretty well known more and more in recent mm-hmm. years. Yeah. And uh, Bigfoot will be considered a cryptid. So Bigfoot is a creature that the public continues to report, but which scientifically has never been confirmed exists. Okay. And we get these kind of reports. And it's the same thing. I've interviewed thousands of witnesses. I get reports in here all the time from people from all walks of life, police officers, pilots, engineers, scientists, reputable people, 99% of them want no publicity whatsoever. You mm-hmm. get a lot of calls from hunters and outdoorsmen who run into these strange creatures that are not supposed to exist. In right. many cases, their lives are completely changed because they saw something that's not supposed to be around, mm-hmm. and I deal with this all the time. And something's going on out there. I wouldn't be wasting my time. And I'm always out there first trying to explain what they see. Mm-hmm. And many with many UFO sightings, there's many misidentifications. Many turn out to be either natural or man-made in origin. So you've got a a lot of Starlink satellite reports this year. You get bright planet Venus and Jupiter. You get drones. You get balloons. You get a lot of things we can track down Mm -hmm. and explain sightings. But many of the reports coming in, even in the last year, if you go to my website, there's a very big report on there talking about a lot of the strange things in Pennsylvania last year, which there was a lot. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these UFO sightings last year, 
were daylight. And a lot of these were very large cylindrical objects, kind of cigar-shaped things that were wingless. And we do have some pretty good pictures of some of them from different areas. Many people saw them sometimes just hovering in beautiful afternoons and then just instantaneously vanishing and gone. Mm. And then we had numerous reports of very large, solid black triangular objects also in the area. And we've had those reports for years. And a lot of these cases occur not just in rural areas, but over the years we've had many incidents in more populated areas near major cities as well, such as Pittsburgh. Stan, you you spent a ton of time and probably money working on this on this thing. Not just the, the Kecksburg incident, but all of this other stuff that you're talking about. Why? Why did you why? Why do you do that? <laughs> It's going on this year. will be going on 65 years. I have never personally seen a UFO or a Bigfoot <laughs> or a ghost or anything. I've seen a lot of evidence over the years. I've collected uh, a lot of evidence. I've had a yeah. lot of scientific people I was involved with investigating. I started this as a 10-year-old kid who was interested in science. Okay. And I just happened one day back in 1959 to hear a radio show talking about strange things, hauntings, flying saucers. And I wondered, are these people making these stories that they tell the truth? Mm -hmm. Made a lot of trips to the Greensburg Library, started reading what books they had on the subject, mm -hmm. cutting articles out to put in scrapbooks. And then Kecksburg happened, 1965. Yeah. And I started documenting it. It broke on the news. And I've been out in the field ever since. How old were you then in 1965? I was 16. You were 16. All right. So you start being a uh, UFO investigator at, at age 16, right? I actually I started when I was 10 in 1959, but I was out in the field doing actual investigation in 1965 and ever since then. Okay. What did your parents tell you when you were doing that? Were they, did they think you were crazy or what? Unfortunately, my, my mother had died at a young age, and then oh. my father passed away several years later. Okay. And um, they were very supportive. My family was always supportive, and luckily— and. I have a very large support by the public around here doing these things, and you'd just be amazed at the input and the interest here in Pennsylvania. I know that, and I have to tell you, I keep getting phone I still get phone calls from people about it, and who want to know what did I think, and all this, and I always say it's a hell of a story, isn't it? Because I, I really don't have any solid inf I have uh, You have far more solid information than I do. Hell, I have no information other than what you tell me and what other people who uh, who have been involved in this tell me. It's been a it's been a, a crazy thing and I have to hand it to you for being so determined and dedicated. I just find it interesting that you went from UFO sightings to Bigfoot encounters and now creepy cryptids. <laughs> Why did you expand from UFO sightings to these other things? It's not something I was going to do. And yeah. I can tell you, yes, I always had an interest in strange reports of people reporting. And there has always been a history of Bigfoot sightings in Pennsylvania going back to the Native Americans and newspaper accounts in the 1800s talking about these wild men of the forest. They didn't call them Bigfoot back in those days, so it wasn't new. Mm -hmm. And I was investigating some Bigfoot reports in the, in the 60s, late 60s in this area. I had always thought that Bigfoot was some type of unknown primate, some type of unknown animal. 1973 comes around. Luckily, my group was already in existence, my volunteer group. We were covering the whole state of Pennsylvania. I had a lot of volunteers involved and a lot of more educated, professional specialists. And anyhow, first we had the biggest UFO outbreak in history. And there were many newspapers covered stories for months across the state of hundreds of UFO sightings, many not lights in the sky, but low-level solid objects below the ground, things we could not easily identify. And then in the summer of 73, we had the biggest outbreak of Bigfoot sightings ever documented that went on for months and months in the 74. That was also being picked up by a lot of the news media. Many of the sightings were in daylight, many at very close range sometimes multiple creatures. My teams, or police, or both, would many times arrive on the scene within minutes, hours after they occurred, so we could document it very well. And that's when we really got involved and we began to realize that Bigfoot was much stranger than an unknown species of animal, which is why there's no bodies. One of the first things that we noticed was we get out to some of these locations, even in the snow. There'd be a large, there'd be a series of large, unusual footprints with very large strides between them that would mm -hmm. go a distance and then just abruptly end when there should have been more tracks. Did you see and them? And I wrote about, say again? 
Did you see them? Oh, yeah. I yeah. was out there many times. We made many casts of the footprints. I have many of the casts. Oh, really? And and I had forensic people. I had the anthropologists in my group. We knew when something was fabricated or not. There was not a lot of hoaxes until you had a few after it got in the news. But prior to that, you didn't. And we could tell the difference very easily. But yeah. I wrote about this in the 70s. And now all over the country now and around the world, the same thing I was talking about years ago is now happening all over the country. You're starting to hear more radio shows about it. You're seeing more TV shows talking about it. Mm-hmm. And I'm telling you, we're dealing with something with a lot of these objects in the sky and some of these strange creature reports. We're dealing with something that has a physical and a non-physical component to it. These things come when they go. We don't understand the science behind them. For lack of a better term, I'll say they're interdimensional, which, for example, there's no bodies of Bigfoot. And we have many cases now which which we can understand why there's no bodies. It's very strange and bizarre. I don't think anybody understands, including the government. If there are footprints and you have casts of those footprints, Mm -hmm. then there has to be something that made those footprints, correct? Exactly. All right. And we have been- so I'm just wondering why it is that if this huge large creature and probably more than one of them exists, why hasn't anyone actually seen it or taken a Once of it? Once again, some of this is so strange and believe me, I was not looking for this kind of information. Mm-hmm. But it began to come in from widespread you gotta remember nineteen seventy three, there's no cell phone, there's no internet like today. Yeah. People did not know about the other report. They had no way of knowing what other people were seeing. Yeah. So we get all this data coming in, and the many years since then, including the last couple of years of these stranger, stranger reports. Mm-hmm. And I, I can give you a couple of examples, and, and I'll try to do it brief because they're very involved reports, but they're amazing, and they've been written up all over the world. Mm-hmm. And I can remember one case was October 25, 1973. I get a, that evening about 10.30, I get a call from a state trooper from Uniontown State Police Barracks. He said, can you get one of your teams up here as soon as you can? There's a chance of something still up on the farm. To make the story short, this was a multiple witness landing of 15 people that observed this barn-sized red sphere about 100 feet off the ground hovering and slowly beginning to move down towards the pasture. To make the story short, the farmer's son, the adult who was going out to visit his family on the farm, he saw it coming down the farm road, and the neighbor saw it. And they decided to go up to see what this thing is. So he and two neighbor boys decided to go up to the pasture. About 250 feet away, this object was now landed on the ground or right above it. But now it was a half of a sphere, about a big white dome, about 100 feet in diameter, illuminating the area. To make the story more interesting, there's two huge air-covered Bigfoot creatures standing in the field at the same time. That's the very short part of the story. Wow. When, when the object had left the area and the creatures had gone back into the woods, the state trooper arrived 45 minutes later. When he went up to the scene when the witness, the trooper told me the whole area where the object had been on the ground was self-luminescent and glowing. But 100 feet in diameter, the animals would not go into it. And he said, if I had a newspaper, I could probably read the local newspaper without just from the light coming off the glow. That's the short part of that story. Wow. Okay. You've made a lot of public appearances to discuss Kecksburg and these other unexplained happenings, right? Yes. Yeah. So what's that experience been like, Stan? Have people come, you mentioned that people come forward to, and provide you with more information, right? Oh, yeah. There, there's no doubt. I, I've talked for years all over the country and more in the tri-state area now last few years, and I'm just jammed already for the crest for this year. And a lot of events are coming up, and it's very interesting. But every, almost everywhere I go, and some of these places have some pretty good-sized audiences from people from all walks of life. And almost everywhere, people come up to me afterwards and tell me about the things that they've seen, or they'll contact me later privately, because none of these people have reported what they saw to anybody. Okay. We can't even imagine how much of this is going on out there that the public doesn't know about. There was a, a, a very interesting incident. This happened last week. I'll be posting a report about it on my website probably later today or tomorrow. Mm-hmm. It was seen not only in Pennsylvania, but we now have information from other parts of, other parts of the country in Canada. It's very interesting. Whatever this thing was, it still remains a mystery. But there's a lots and lots of reports on my website of things that you cannot easily dismiss. And these things are going on all the time, probably much more commonly than anybody realized, and, and you're probably aware, Bob, that the government now has 
a, an office that is officially investigating UFOs. It right. is no longer a laughing matter. The government's taken it seriously. They're at least admitting that there are objects out there that they themselves could not identify. And it's, it's a worldwide phenomenon. It's not new. It's been going on for years and years. But we're beginning to see a more serious interest in it. Congress is pushing to get more information released from the government. And you have been hearing a lot about in the last year, even in recent months. And I'm sure as this year goes on, you'll be hearing more and more news about it. Yeah, I just wonder, since the government has gotten involved and there's this, this government agency that is doing this work, have you been in touch with them? Have they been in touch with you? You've got a ton of information that probably would be helpful to them. I'm sure that these probably these agencies are they're probably very interested going on. I'm sure they're probably watching websites out, and my website has a lot of information on there. Uh, and I'm sure that they're monitoring what's going on, so mm -hmm. they're probably aware of some of these things. Yeah. Okay. You established a UFO hotline for the public to report UFO sightings, right? Yeah, it started in 1969, and it's never stopped ringing right through the last couple of days. Oh, it's so it's still been... And I get reports, a lot of reports by email as well. Okay, what's the number for that hotline? They can call me at area code 724-838-7768, and I'm just getting information in the last couple of hours. Like I said, there was a significant incident. I've had other reports over the last several weeks and months. I've got some other things I'm still looking at just for the last few days. And I'm getting emails about an incident that reportedly happened, I believe. I deal mainly in Pennsylvania, but I do get out-of-state reports. But right. it's something that's supposedly happened up in Massachusetts involving a number of pilot airline pilots. And I guess this is something that's just starting to come out, this information. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about the reports that airline pilots or military pilots have seen unexplained things while they were flying around while they, the pilots, were flying their planes. What, what do you make of that? It's not surprising whatsoever. They're up there quite a bit, and there have been sightings for years and years. Now, over the many years I've, I've done this, again, I've interviewed thousands of witnesses, including commercial pilots, private, pro, private pilots, corporate pilots, who have seen these things. Mm -hmm. I've talked to many of them over the years, mm -hmm. and none of them filed reports because they wanted to keep their license, and that's just how it is. I've talked to air traffic controllers who have seen these things. Very credible people have been seeing these things for years and years, but they've been reluctant to go public for various reasons. Yeah. But the reports are very consistent. They're seeing something. And yes, a lot of sightings, as I mentioned before, are explainable. But I can give you multitudes of incidents that I investigated, and some you'll find interesting. I'll, I'll give you one from outside of Greensburg, of all places. It's, it's September 3rd, 1987, because you know the area. Mm -hmm. This was around 8 o'clock in the evening, what was in the Green Gate Mall, which I'm sure you remember. Sure. And anyhow, there were multiple witnesses, including law enforcement, this huge object, huge metallic oval-shaped, metallic, like a, a well-oversized blimp, no markings on it, multiple lights, completely silent, again, about 300 feet long, was moving about 300 feet over top of the high-tension power lines, right very close to what was in the Green Gate Mall. This right. object moved across, across over top of Route 30, so over the cars, moved to the other side of the road where you had the Green Gate apartments or where you had a power substation. This huge object turns vertical in the sky, and all the power in the area went out, including the mall. And when the engineers from the power company went to investigate, I was told that all three of master fuses in the line had been blown, something that's just unheard of. Wow. So whatever came of that, do you know? There was no explanation for it. Many people mm -hmm. saw it. I still run the people every once in a while who, who saw it but never came forward. Mm -hmm. That's just an example. I can give you multiple incidents of daylight sightings of large objects low the ground. There, there are so many stories out there, and the public's not aware of these type of things. Yeah. What other what else is really amazing? And I've been doing. I knew about these in, incidents since the 1960s. Mm -hmm. I've called them mini UFOs. You'll hear some people on the internet talking about orbs of light, small balls of light to the ground. I've right. called them mini UFOs for years. Mm -hmm. These sightings have increased more and more. And in 2022, got the years mixed up, they're all so close anymore, that this, we had the biggest surge of these cases in Pennsylvania we've ever had from multiple parts of the state. Interestingly, these, these small objects, 
they're anywhere from very small to about a golf ball size to a baseball size, and a lot of them around a foot or two in diameter. They're generally spherical, generally just bright light sources of various colors, but in some reports I've had, they've come very close to people. They're metallic or solid looking. In the last couple of years, we've had more and more reports of these things come, actually coming within feet of people in daylight. Amazing story. Some of them are even much stranger. I've had incidents over the years where they've followed vehicles. They've entered people's homes and cars through open windows. They've hovered uh, and actually actually were seen hovering right in front of, of people's living room windows of homes. And they heard these things tapping on the window. When they went through the window, they saw the thing moving away. And these are coming in again from widespread areas, from people who have no reason to make these stories up. Wow. What do you think the source of these things might be? Where well, do they come from? Again, we can only theorize. I think we're dealing with something that's very strange beyond our present scientific understanding. Uh -huh. And for a lack of a better term, again, I'll say they're, they're interdimensional. We're dealing with something from another reality that under certain conditions, which seems to be energy-related, these things come in, they come into our reality. They can leave physical evidence. At times, they look completely physical, and then they're gone. They change physical form. They vanish and disappear. And that's similar to what some of the military pilots are saying, too. Yeah, I, I have many instances in daylight of these large solid objects hovering and mm -hmm. slowly beginning to fade away. Or in some yeah. cases, they change physical form right in front of the witnesses. Okay. And some of these cases, again, have been really quite amazing. There was an incident that just happened last year among the many reports that happened during 2023. Mm -hmm. And Fayette County is one of the most active areas in the country along the Chestnut Ridge and here in Westmoreland County as well, for ongoing reports of UFOs, Bigfoot, other anomalous events. It's just amazing the things that are going on. Even in recent weeks, we're getting reports up there. Wow. And again, the people are seeing these things. They want no publicity. Yeah. A lot of them are a little shaken by what they experience. Mm -hmm. But So let me tell you about this one. It's really intriguing. This is November 6th of 23, not long mm -hmm. ago. On November 16th, it was a beautiful day here, around 2 o'clock in the afternoon. It's a beautiful day. I believe the temperature was around 60 degrees, very unusually warm for this time of the year. This neighbor lady was started to take a walk outside because it was so nice, happened to look over her neighbor's home. 50 feet above the roof of her neighbor's home, she sees this large, solid, black triangle object hovering. Mm -hmm. As she's watching, it begins to physically change form from a triangle to a square and back to a triangle. So she's watching this thing for a few minutes. There's no lights on. It's making no sound. Right. So she thought, I better go call my neighbor and tell her what's going on. So right. she goes to the home to call the neighbor where the thing's hovering. There's no answer. So she decides she's going to walk over to the neighbor's house. It's still there above the lady's house. Mm -hmm. The lady was outside working in her garden, and she didn't even know about the thing over her home till the neighbor pointed out to her. So they're both watching this thing right. change in form. It begins to rise about 500 feet over the home. And as they watch for a few minutes, it rises up into the sky so it looks like just a dark spot, and it's gone. Those are the kind of things that are going on, and nobody knows about it. Well, do you think that they – are these things from some other planet or what? No, I think for from another reality. We just – it's something we just don't understand yet. Okay. And, and it's more and more, again, it's not just in Pennsylvania. We're yeah. getting similar reports from all over the country and around the world, uh -huh. and this is what's going on. Nobody knows what's happening. It, it seems again. It seems to be energy connected, but again, we're just uh, we're just going on what we're starting to learn about science. People in the science community now are beginning to look into this more. We don't even understand what we're talking about. We can only go by the patterns we're seeing, the similarity reports. We don't understand it. Nobody understands it. Okay. Do you feel like the work that you've done has produced anything of? I I think that. All I can tell you is this. A lot of people call me. I've had two emails from people who want to talk to me from out of the area, and I can just tell from what they're telling me. They're, a lot of their experiences are similar. So many people never share their experiences, and for them it's affected their lives, and they want to find out if what they saw is real, is it similar to what other people saw. And people are generally pretty glad to learn that they're not the only ones, that other people, even in their areas, are experiencing something similar. And this is something that happens quite a bit. So mm -hmm. that's what we're seeing. We're seeing so much of this. And a lot of this data that I've, I put out and some of the other researchers I work with over the years, 
it's it's beginning to get a lot more credibility now. I, I think the fact that government now is at least acknowledging there's something out there we can't explain, it's giving a lot more support to the many witnesses who took a lot of ridicule with these type of reports over the years, sure. and it's at least it's supporting what they're saying. So I think people are more happy about that. Yeah, right. What do you do for a living, Stan? I'm retired. I worked in electronics field all my life, and I did that all my life, and I did this at the same time. Yeah, and, I was just uh, going to ask you, you spent all this time working on this stuff, trying to explain or trying to find out what was going on, what has been going on, but you had a job. So how did you balance that? You know what? People ask me, how do you do it? And I can say, I really don't know how I did it, but we did it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and yeah, we did it. We, we had family stuff going on yeah. over, over the years. I was running two organizations. I had okay. a full-time job and I still did it. And my hotline has run 24 hours a day. <laughs> I get calls sometimes two or three o'clock in the morning and <laughs> we're still doing it. And I don't know how I do it. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're crazy is what I think. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you, you just never know what that next call is going to be, that it might be the case that once and for all is going to produce the evidence you've been looking for and, and the people are looking for. Okay. So what's your personal belief? Do you feel like do you, do you feel like these things are sourced from some other planet or or what? I mean, what's your thought? I, I think dealing with the UFO, or the government calls it UAP now, unidentified anomalous phenomena. And I think that's a much better terminology because also what I've discovered over the years, and I think they're finding out as well, that whatever we're dealing with is much more complex. It may well be associated with other type of anomalies, which I've been finding for years and years, uh -huh. and nobody understands it. But I think, one, maybe a small number of these reports of these objects could be extraterrestrial. But whatever else we're dealing with, I think in many cases, again, you have these incidents uh, both the objects and, believe it or not, the Bigfoot reports, which, again, why there's no bodies, of these things being both physical and non-physical at times. They can leave evidence at times, just like UFOs sometimes leave physical traces, and then they're gone. Mm -hmm. And that's why, again, there's no really good tangible evidence for a lot of these cases, even though it is very possible that there are a few incidents where something did fall from the sky. It was not re-entry of space debris. It was something else. It was much stranger that there apparently may have been recoveries around the world of objects not, that were not man-made. You're hearing more about this on the news mm -hmm. from the government whistleblower. I went to Congress to talk about this. Mm -hmm. And these are the things that I dealt with for years and others as well. And uh, the government may, in fact, have some of these objects in their custody. You know what? I think you need to be a witness before uh, some congressional committee to talk about this because you've got all this information they're probably trying to find out. Maybe someday you never know what's going to happen with these investigations. And I yeah. think at some point, maybe other people get involved in this even deeper. I don't know how much deeper I can get, but there's a lot out there. And I do put a lot of things out on my website, important cases. So right. a lot of these people who are interested in these investigations, they're probably seeing what's going on by looking at my website and many other ones. Yeah. What's your website address, by the way? It's Stan Gordon, G-O-R-D-O-N dot info, I-N-F-O, Stan Gordon dot info. Okay. Very good. How can people find your books and how can they reach out to you to talk about whatever they want to talk about? Again, they can call me 724-838-7768. My website has contact information. The best email is sightings at the at sign, sightings at stangordon.info, sightings at stangordon.info. And all my um, books are available on amazon.com or barnesandnoble.com. And the Kecksburg documentary, Kex for the Untold Story, which I won a film award for actually many years ago. You're mm -hmm. actually on it and it's still available on Amazon.com. Okay. Yeah, I know I'm on <laughs> I know I'm on that. That's great. All right, Stan. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to add, my friend? No, I just encourage people to keep an open mind. If you see something unusual, try to document it, try to get some pictures of it. <laughs> keep checking my website. And there's a lot of other good ones out there. And keep your eyes to the sky. Okay. Keep your eyes to the sky. Hey, guys. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this Lean to the Left video and you found it interesting and informative. Please visit on a regular basis and check out our interviews with guests on topics that focus on progressive politics and the important social issues of our time. 
Now, our interview shows stream on Mondays with special episodes on Thursdays. And you can check out upcoming shows, guests, and topics at podcast.leantotheleft.net. Subscribe to our audio version there and to our video shows here at YouTube. And follow us on social media, Facebook at Bob Gaddy and the Lean to the Left podcast. Now, it's two. Bob Gaddy is one Facebook page. And the Lean to the Left podcast is a second Facebook page. Twitter at Lean to the Left one. Instagram at Lean to the Left one. TikTok at Lean to the Left. LinkedIn at Bob Gaddy. And YouTube at Lean to the Left. Now, I hope you'll support Lean to the Left as well so we can keep things going. Just click on the Donate tab at the top of the leantotheleft.net homepage and contribute by buying me a cup of coffee. That will really help and would be much, much, much appreciated. Now, this is Bob Gaddy signing off for Lean to the Left. Thanks for sharing your time with us.